as the world now waits to see what's next for our next guest with the welterweight division being one of the most exciting in the UFC, we have to get the great American winning machine back on the program. He joins us today. Chaos is in the house. Colby Covington. Look at this. Look at this setup right here. Look at that red phone. Welcome back to Submission Radio. Thank you so much for taking time away from this important phone call, it looks like, that just happened on, on that awesome phone and joining us on the program. It's a pleasure to have you, man. It's a, it's a pleasure to be back with my, my brothers from down under. So obviously there's a lot to talk about uh, since we last spoke to you. I know you went out, did a bunch of interviews last week talking about ATT. So we want to speak to you about that, the future, what's next. But obviously let's start things off with something fresh. And that was this past weekend, your longtime rival, the man that last time you're on the program, you said you wanted to face in Tyron Woodley, a very tough fight for him uh, this past weekend against Gilbert Burns, but a very impressive showing from Gilbert Burns. So just wanted to get your thoughts, man. What did you think of that fight? Uh, now that it's in the books. Guys, let's start off by having a moment of silence for Woodley's career. Hold on one second. Just just one second. Moment of silence. That's oh, Woodley's dear. career going down the drain. Just like I told you guys, he's washed up. He don't want to fight no more. He's TMZ Woodley. You know, he, he's out there rapping, making songs about me, hurting people's eardrums. So, you know, who called it? I said he was washed up. I said he's 40 years old. He's a 40-year-old virgin. You know, he doesn't want to fight anymore. He, all he did was show up for a paycheck. So, you know, I, I figured we'd have a moment of silence for him. And, you know, I'd pour out a beer for his career because just like his career, it went down right down the drain. Mm, you, meant, you did mention, I saw in some interviews leading into the fight that, you believe that Woodley was washed up. I mean, what did you actually think of the performance that you, that you saw in there and what Gilbert Burns was able to do? Uh, you know, I didn't, honestly, I had better things to do, guys. You, you know, you know, the raw American steel and twisted sex appeal, you know, I got to get with the finest bitches from, and the mamacitas in South Beach. So I ain't got the time to watch all these jobbers fight, you know. I knew that Woodley was washed up. I knew he's just showing up for a paycheck, you know. You saw that in his last fight with Marty Fake Newsman that, there's no fight left in him, you know? He's he's literally just showing up to get paychecks, you know? He he was cashed out years ago. I mean, when's the last time the guy won around? Like three, four years ago? I mean, the guy the guy's over the hill. He, sh he shouldn't be fighting anymore, but that's what's sad about this business is these guys just have to keep coming and getting these paychecks even when they're old and still in walkers because, you know, they don't know how to to, to manage money the right way. It's a, what, it's a surreal situation as well, because we remember, I mean, you've been coming on the show for such a long time now, and we always appreciate you coming on the program and speaking with us, but this fight between you and Woodley, man, you've been building this fight for so long, and it looked like it was going to happen, and then it didn't, and then it looked like it was going to happen this year, and then it didn't, and now it looks like it's never going to happen. I mean, how does that feel to you? You put so much time and effort in building this fight that ultimately, you know, is just never going to be put together now because Tyron Woodley sort of lost this fight this past weekend. Yeah, you know, uh, in my opinion, you know, business goes on, you know, it sucks. You know, I built that fight for, you know, three, four years. You know, I was begging to fight that guy on five days notice because I know how washed up he is. And, you know, he never wanted to fight me. It, this is plain and simple. Even when he was the champion and I had the interim title, I mean, he was begging to fight lightweights. He was begging to fight anybody but me. And I'm the first guy to scare the champion into elective shoulder surgery. So, you know, the guy's been scared of me since day one. We used to train together at American Top Team. So, you know, I think just people found out how, how much of a man I am of my word. You know, every time I say something, it's the truth. Maybe it's the brutal, honest truth, but it's still the truth, you know. And he ducked me his whole career, and that's that. I mean, he can he can go and, and, and know that he was a coward, you know. He didn't want to fight the best guys in the division, and – and, you know, the thing is, is that he's happy now. Yeah, he got these two losses out of the way and he got his paychecks. But you know what? Woodley didn't have to lose to me. So, you know, he can he can ride off into the sunset, you know, and and go to his retirement home and just and be be happy that he doesn't have to deal with the, the psyche, psychiatric, you know, that he would have had to deal with if he would have had to fight me. So, you know, he, he's thankful and he's lucky. He dodged a bullet. Um, on the flip side, though, you've got a fresh new contender in, in Gilbert Burns, and I know everyone's trying to figure out what exactly is next for you. Were you impressed with what Burns was able to do? And is he a guy that you're interested in now? Has is, is he popped up on your radar after this win over Woodley? You mean Dilbert? 
<laughs> Gil- yeah. Gil- Gilbert Burns, the man you refer to as Dilbert, correct? Ah, uh, never heard of him. It's no, in- not 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 impressed at all by his performance over the weekend. Ne- never heard of him. Never watched a performance of his. Don't even know who he is. I, I mean, I, I honestly, I don't know. I don't care. But you know what? That's funny. You're talking about performances and this and that. I think there's a performance supposed to be coming up where you guys are sell- sending an Australian hooker to America to fight a guy named Dustin Doofus Poirier. Is that true? <laughs> I heard there's some complications getting out of Australia right now to America. Uh, he, well, he's from New Zealand, Dan Hooker, but... He's a good guy. I think you guys would get along. He's a good dude, and I think it's going to be an interesting fight. At actually picking him against Dustin. But let me ask you this: yeah, he had a beef with Woodley, so I think you guys would be technically allies in a sense. He likes to have a beer and a good time, and he's a good bloke. But let me ask you this: you don't really know Gilbert too well, but Gil- <laughs> Dilbert, as you like to call him, but people are saying, oh, there's a real chance that this man might get a title shot against Kamara Usman next. You don't know much about Dilbert, of course, but. What, how would a fight with Usman go if, 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 if Gilbert was to match up with him? And what do you think about these talks right now of people saying, hey, this guy's a real shot of getting the next title shot? I could care less. Nobody knows who that guy is. You know, let them fight. If they fight, that just means the biggest fight in the welterweight division is open the door. And that's me versus Street Judas Masvidal. Everybody knows that's a real beef. And that score needs to be settled. So, you know, Jud- Judas Masvidal, he's got nowhere to go. We know he ducked Marty Fake Newsman, but... He's got no other fights to, to be made. So, you know, the biggest fight that, that could happen in the welterweight division is the man, me, versus uh, the loser, Street Judas Masvidal. Hmm. Well, just out of curiosity, why do you think that this fight, because everyone thought it's going to be Usman versus Masvidal. Everybody thought it was a lock. Why do you think this fight has seemingly gone further and further away from happening um, and, and now it seems like it might not even happen at all? Because just like I told you guys, you know, months ago, I called this from the start, guys. I said that journeyman Judas, street Judas Masvidal was going to overprice himself. He thinks that his, you know, broken, mediocre fighter BMF belt is worth something. It's not worth anything. It's a partition. It's a Bernie Sanders participation trophy. So he overpriced himself. He thought he was worth Conor McGregor money. He was asking for five, 10 million to fight Marty Fake Newsman. And they didn't want to give him, you know, anywhere even near that. So. You know, let's be honest, you know, if Judas isn't going to show up to fight for an average payday against a guy he knows he has no chance to beat. So, you know, Journeyman's all hype. He's not going to beat Marty Fake Newsman. He knows that deep down inside. I mean, Dan Lambert knows that deep down inside. So, you know, it's just, you know, he, he overpriced himself out like I called from the, the start. And now he's going to be on the sidelines. It's either going to be me rematching Marty Fake Newsman or me fighting Street Judas Masvidal. Does, does it make you think about the fact that Ali Abdulaziz manages both Kamara Usman and Gilbert Burns and how that sort of plays towards possibly Usman and Burns coming together because they're under the same management company? What was the question? <laughs> Gilbert Burns and Kamara Usman both managed by Ali Abdulaziz. And I suppose as these negotiations come together, it will make sense for, uh, for him to put this fight together. Does that make you sort of nervous that that fight might get tied up because of that factor? Yep, still don't care. Just like all the people. <laughs> the people do not care about that fight. That fight won't sell 10,000 pay-per-views, let alone 1,000 pay-per-views. So, you know, I could care less if they want to make some fight with some guy that was just getting knocked out by lightweights and nobody knows who they are. So I'm not interested in that fight. The people aren't interested in that fight. You know, there's only there's only two fights to make in the welterweight division. That's me versus Marty Fake Newsman or me versus Street Jewish Masvidal. And and if it can't be that, then, you know, what about that doofus Dustin Poirier? You know, he was telling all the nerds in the media, oh, next time I see Colby, it's on site. It's on site, motherfucker. Let's go meet in the octagon then. I'll paint your blood on the canvas just like a modern day Picasso. Wow, that's interesting because last time you were on the program, um, you sort of squashed the beef with Dustin Poirier. It was it was a big story that week. I'm just wondering what what changed. Why 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 are you sort of back to wanting to fight Dustin now? Yeah, you know that was when I was under the rules, you know, of of a gym. You know, I, I was respecting the rules and I made promises, and everybody knows I'm promises made, promises kept. You know, and I respected Dan Lambert, and I didn't want to put him in that position. But guess what, guys? Now we're at Colby Covington Incorporated, CCI, and we do whatever we want. There's no feelings. This isn't the ultimate feelings championship. This is the ultimate fighting championship. So doofus Dustin has to, he needs to, he needs to man up for his word. 
his word was, oh, I'm going to fight Kobe on site. I've seen that guy multiple times. He didn't even try and fight me because he knows what happens if he tries to fight me. He will get put down real quick. He'll never be able to look at his daughter the same ever again, and his wife will probably divorce him because he's going to be ugly as fuck after I'm done with his face. It's a, it was an interesting situation, like Casper mentioned on the program, because obviously you've left American Top Team, and you revealed last week to Ariel Hawani that you didn't want to keep putting Dan Lambert through a hard time, and you also are titled to be able to voice his speech. Obviously, there were some rules in the gym where people couldn't talk about each other. And then we do remember, like Casper mentioned, when you came on the show and you issued that apology to Dustin Poirier, and we could see that it wasn't really something that you wanted to do, but it was probably something that you had to do for Dan Lambert. So kind of break it down for us, man. What was the final straw that finally led you to leaving, and how hard was it? I mean, what, what really happened behind the scenes when you came on our show and made that apology to Dustin? What was the conversation behind the scenes, and how hard was it to actually have to go out and do that? Yeah, it was extremely hard. That's not something I ever have done or, or will ever do ever again. You know, it was just for to save my relationship with Dan Lambert. I still consider him a mentor. I consider him a friend. You know, we, we, we had a great journey together. You know, I won a world title with him. You know, I was able to repay all my debts to Dan Lambert. I took him to the White House. No fighter's ever done that. No fighter's ever going to do that ever again. So, you know, I feel like accomplished that I was able to repay all my debts and favors that Dan did to me to bring me to a world championship by bringing him to the White House and seeing his favorite president of all time, Donald Trump. So, you know, the, the words were, you know, he just didn't want all the gym drama. You know, he thought that it was affecting the practices and, you know, George is screaming across the gym, Dustin's screaming across the gym, you know, acting like they're tough, like they're going to fight me, like there's drama and this and that. But they're just looking for attention. They're not looking to really fight They're just because they know what happens if they fight me. They're, they're getting put face down, motionless on the octagon or in the streets, either one that they want to pick. But so, you know, I wanted to salvage my relationship with Dan, but, you know, it just came to a point where it wasn't salvageable anymore. You know, it's just everybody's feelings have been hurt. You know, you got Joanne crying to Dan because she's sensitive. You got Doofus Dustin crying to Dan because he's sensitive and has feelings. You got Journeyman Street Judas Mosfidal crying to Dan. Oh, when, 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 Kobe said some mean words about me, Dan. Kick him off the team. So, you know, guess what? Now at CCI, Kobe Covington Incorporated, you direct your complaints directly to me. You don't direct your complaints to Dan Lambert anymore. If you got a problem, come see me. But, you know, we know that ain't going to happen. They ain't going to come see me. Mm. It's a fast, It was really a fascinating sort of relationship that you had because we knew you, you had all these beefs with these fighters and then you made that apology to Dustin. But when we, we never heard back from Dustin after you made that apology. It seems like he never sort of responded. Did you actually end up chatting with him after you made that apology on Submission Radio? Did he say anything? Did he speak to you at the gym at all? What, what happened after that? And did you actually have Jorge yelling at you while you were training and people trying to sort of fight you while you were training? No, there was never any communication or anything said to Dustin, you know. Uh, there wasn't anything needed to be said, you know. He said some stupid things in, in the media about me first. If you guys you could go back in the media and look about what he said after his fight and in his interviews, oh, next time I see Kobe, it's on site. Oh, I'm going to beat up Kobe. Oh, I'm going to do this to Kobe. He ain't doing anything to the man. If he wanted to do something to the man, he'd come and do it. But he knows better than that. He knows he has a family. And he's not going to make it back to his family if he comes to seize the man. So there's nothing to be said to doofus Dustin, you know. The, guy, the guy's a complete joke. And like I said originally, you know, he's a, he's a jobber. He's a, he's a JV level amateur fighter. He and that's the honest truth. I said truth. I you know Dan got mad at me for for being honest, for saying the truth. Yeah, maybe the truth for other people wasn't the truth for me, but for me against these jobbers, that's the truth. So there was nothing else to say. And yeah, there was multiple times where these guys come in the gym, Doofus Dustin, Street Judas Mosfidal, they're screaming across the gym, they're yelling at the mats. You know that. You know, the, the trainings are getting uh, interrupted. All the pro fighters that have fights coming on, they're being disrespectful towards them. They're being disrespectful towards Dan. You know, they don't respect Dan. If they respected Dan, they wouldn't have made a big problem of it because I'm a, I'm a businessman. I keep my business in the cage. Yeah, if you want to sell your business outside the cage, trust me, I'm not scared to fight. I love to fight. Fighting is my favorite thing to do in the whole entire world. And it just so happens I'm the best fighter in the entire world. So I love to fight. But these guys, they just love the drama. 
and they have feelings and they're all sensitive. So they just want to scream across the gym. They just want all the coaches to come break them up, see all the fighters, you know, disrupt their trainings and make a big deal. So Dan had to step in, you know, and that's what happened. You know, Dan had to step in and, and Dan was just getting so hot. So, you know, I just didn't want to put him in that situation anymore. So I just figured it was the best for me to just cut ties and go my own way. Come to Colby Covington Incorporated now. This is a much better business model for me. I have a much better team. You know, this is individualized trainings around me. This is only focused on me and my training camps. And, you know, it's kind of like boxer training camps, like, like a Mayweather, where he brings in multiple training partners. He has his coaches and everything's centered around him. So, you know, that's, that's important to me because no, one, no one's going to tell me, guys, you know, you, you can't take away my freedoms. In America, we have constitutional rights. You can't take away my freedom of speech. You cannot take away my freedom of opinion. I don't care who you are. I, you know, I will not sell my soul for money. That's not me. Those guys will. But I'm a different breed. So, you know, I'm a last of a dying breed. And, and when I'm gone from this career, everybody's going to gonna wish I would come back. Mm, and it seems like a very stressful time indeed. You mentioned all those situations. What was the final situation that sort of bro bro uh, broke the camel's back? What was the final situation where you were like, that's it, I'm out? Because I'm guessing... You would have been on the fence for a long time now talking to Dan trying to fix everything what was that final point where you were like look I just can't be here anymore I just can't do this anymore I'm out of here I'm starting my own thing do you remember what that was in your mind uh yeah I vaguely remember you know it to be honest guys it started back in Brazil like two years ago you know when I when I told Brazil you know they're filthy animals and, and the place is a dump because it's the truth the place is a dump and all those people are filthy animals and they were acting like filthy animals when they were saying I was gonna die you know, you will die, you buy more. Oh, I fucked your mother, this and that, saying these vulgar things to my family. So when I dish it to them, they, they can take it, but they, you know, they can dish it, but they can't take it. So, you know, that's what really started to disrupt the relationship. I could see how much pressure Dan Lambert was under and he didn't like it. You know, he didn't like that all the Brazilians were coming to him, complaining, trying to get me kicked off the team. So I, I, I felt, you know, he felt what the hot seat was like then. But then as, you know, things started to progress, and, you know, you got journeyman Judas Masvidal trying to call me out. You got Dustin trying to say things about me in the media. You got Joanne trying to say things in the media, you know. And, and eventually, you know, it just became too much for him, you know. And I could just tell in his text messages and his calls that it was a lot of pressure. And I, I didn't want to put him under that pressure, man. Dan Lambert's a great person. He's a great friend to me. We've been through some great times, you know. We did our impact wrestling angle. And, and I still consider that guy a, a second father to me. So, I didn't want to put that pressure and stress on him no more. I don't want fighters coming to him complaining, oh, Kobe's this, oh, Kobe's that. He doesn't need that in his life, man. He's he's a middle-aged man with millions of dollars and all the money in the world. He can do whatever he wants the rest of his life. You think he needs to deal with some high school drama? We're fighters. We're ultimate fighters. And you got these ultimate feelings competitors coming to him all the time. So, you know, I just figured that I would take it on my own way and leave on my own on my own horse, you know, I didn't, I didn't need someone to tell me to leave because, you know, I, I did what was best. I respect Dan. I didn't want to put him in that, in that, in that situation anymore. I have too much respect for him, but those other guys, Dustin, Joanne, uh, journeyman, Judas street, Judas, Masvidal, those guys, they want to make his life a living hell. They want to put the pressure on him. They want to, you know, just keep complaining to him every single day. So, you know, I just, this was the best fit for me. And, and I could never be happier, you know. I just the, the way things played out and the way things are going now, everything's great. And when you guys see me next time, it's going to be Colby 2.0, and you guys are going to be shocked. I'm going to do things you guys never seen before, and you're going to see a completely different me next time I step in that octagon. Mm. And we definitely can't wait to see you back in the octagon, and it's going to be very exciting. But I have to say, like, it's pretty wild that you know these points of contention have been going on, you know, all the way back to that infamous brazil promo did you know at that point or did you feel at that point once this all started that your days at american top team were essentially numbered yeah absolutely i, I knew i knew that day that it wasn't going to work i i realized that they didn't understand the business you know and it's crazy because dan lambert is such a pro wrestling freak and he understands the psychology of pro wrestling and he just doesn't understand the psychology of fighting and, and you know, it just when fighters are coming to him with their emotions and feelings, you know, he didn't know what to do, you know, you know, it's just so I, I knew the days were numbered. And, and as soon as they started talking about me, you know, Dustin and George and, and Joanne out of nowhere, I, I never said nothing to her besides her being in my DMs, trying to sweat me, trying to get dates. And I just turned <laughs> out so all of a sudden I'm a bad guy because I, I wouldn't go on a date with her. So, 
You know, it just I knew that I knew this day was coming and, and I was looking for my exit plan. And, and to be honest, man, guys, the last year, like going in there, every time I would go in there, it was just such negative energy and it's such a toxic environment. Like I felt drained, man. It just it took all my energy. It took everything. Like I couldn't get good training. Dude, George would come. You know, I'd be boxing. He'd come scream from the other side of the cage trying to interrupt my trainings like multiple times, probably five to ten times. And. I'm just like, man, I don't need this anymore, dude. I don't need this drama in my life. These guys want to fight. Let's go fight in the octagon. Or if you want to fight and you're really that tough, let's go see each other in the streets. But, you know, that's a whole other subject. But, you know, it's just this is the best thing I could have ever do, do is, is form Colby Covington Incorporated. And, and I'm much happier with less stress these days. Mm. And we know it's a small community over there. And you and Masvidal will most likely run into each other sooner or later. Do you anticipate an altercation on the street before you get a chance to fight in the octagon? And I mean... He's saying that you were a cancer in a gym and a fragile dude. I mean, is this feud personal for you at this point where it would escalate to something outside the octagon for you if you run into him? 110%. You know, just the fake news and, and all the lying he's doing, he's just digging himself a bigger hole. He's making himself look so stupid. I mean, he's turning down fights. Everybody knows he's a coward as it is. So 100% we're going to fight in the streets. I mean, he knows I run the 305. Miami is my city now. I, I run that city. I got all the best connections. I got all the hookups in Miami. So anytime I see that guy, 100% we're going to fade, you know. And he's just that little street thug mentality, you know. He's willing to take a knockout and get beat up in the streets. But he wants to, you know, come at me and act like he's got an ego and act tough and, and like he's some big shot, you know. But he's willing to, to get beat up for it. So, you know, I definitely see an altercation coming. I mean, but you can't believe anything Journeyman Street Judas says in, in interviews anymore, guys. I mean, look at him uh, last week trying to on Twitter talking about how uh, this guy Phil Daru got kicked off the team and got fired. The strength and conditioning coach that never happened. The guy left on his own. And and come on, George, what are you doing, man? You're talking about Doofus Dustin's strength and conditioning coach. You're talking about Joanne's strength and conditioning coach. You think that's nice to say those things? That's not nice. <laughs> I think Dustin and Joanne are going to take their feelings to Dan Lambert. Now you're going to have Dan Lambert on your butt again because you said some mean things about their strength and conditioning coach. So, you know, it, it's just pretty funny, you know. The, the, the three best friends are probably not going to be the three best friends anymore between Dustin, Joanne, and George, and you're probably going to see some divides soon. It's interesting because um, obviously you've been coming on the show for a long time and for a long time it sort of seemed like the Masvidal matchup was something down the road, something in the future, but it seems like you're really steering into it. Um, it sounds almost like it's the top of your list. If you could have, say, Usman, Masvidal, or let's say Dustin as your next fight, who, who would sort of be the front runner? Who would you be leaning towards and who do you think is most likely? You know who I'm leaning towards? You know, it's like mm. an even tie between Marty Fake Newsman and Street Judas Masvidal just because how much controversy was in that first fight with Marty Fake Newsman. I mean, if Mark Goddard doesn't save his life in that second round when I kick him in the lever liver and he's about to fold up like a lawn chair, I finish him and TKO him, and I'm the real world champion of the world right now. But Mark Goddard saved his life. He called an illegal low blow, which, which everybody saw on the camera in the arena that I hit him right clearly in the liver, and he was about to fold up, and I would have got my TKO. And then, you know, just another stoppage for the fake eye poke, and he's selling on the other eye. And then he pokes me at the end of the fourth round. And then, you know, all the shots to the back of the head at the end of the fight, and I'm clearly def intelligently defending myself, and I'm just on a double leg sprawled out, you know, just chilling, just waiting for my moment to get back up. And he calls the fight. I mean, it's just complete It's just complete robbery. And, and uh, you know, everybody knows Mark Goddard was paid to – to rig that fight, you know? And so that, that fight needs to be run back on a level playing field. And then after that fight, you know, it doesn't matter which fight, which order it goes, but me and Marty Fake Newsman will square off again. And me and Street Judas, he's got nowhere to go. We're fighting him one way or another. I don't give a shit. I will come find him in Miami. Everybody knows I know how to find people. Just go ask Dana White. Uh, as far as Usman goes, like he was throwing out Conor McGregor last week, saying that he wants that matchup. Ali Abdelaziz was throwing out Conor McGregor, saying that they're interested in that fight. But Dana White was also saying that your name is sort of in the mix as possible opponents for Usman. Are there any negotiations going on or talks at the moment to have you fight Usman next? Uh, or is it just the case where Dana's throwing your name out there to sort of help with the negotiations? Yeah, I, I think that, I, honestly, I really don't know. You know, I'm not going to come on here and lie and say something that I don't know. I'm, I really don't know. I know that uh, my manager, Lloyd uh, Pearson, over at the Ballinger Group, they're doing a great job of trying to get a contract done. 
you know, I got two fights left on my contract in the UFC. So if they want to renegotiate now, let's get a new deal done, man. Let's get this going, man. I'm, I'm, I'm 32 years young. I'm just getting started. My best days are still ahead of me. So, you know, I'm looking forward. I, I want my new contract, but you know, we can go any way they want to go. It doesn't matter to me. But, uh, as far as the Marty Fake Newsman fight, of course, man, he don't want to fight me, guys. He got wa- I wobbled him multiple times in that fight. You think he wants to fight a fight where he was losing the whole entire fight and a ref had to save him and call a fake stop? But you think he wants to run that back? Hell no, he wants to run that back. He's looking for these easy fights with con man McGregor. He's looking for these easy fights with street Judas journeyman Jorge Masvidal. I mean, of course he wants these easy fights with these little lightweights before he has to see raw American steel again. So, you know, I, I, it's going to take a long time probably to get that rematch just because he doesn't want to fight me. And, his, you know, his, his agent, Ali Abdelis Lees, is the master of, of you know, misdirection and, and finding an easy way out for his, his clients. Mm. How, how do you think a fight between Conor McGregor and Kamara Usman would go? And also, you mentioned you got two fights left on your deal. And you've had a pretty uh, tumultuous relationship with the UFC where they've refused to sort of pay you leading into that Kamara Usman fight and that you've had to renegotiate and you've had issues with Dana White. If they don't appreciate you and what you've done for the company over the next couple of fights, is there a chance that you'd consider offers from other companies that would pay you what you, what you're worth? Um, you know, first and foremost, I want to be a UFC fighter. I love being a UFC fighter. You know, everybody knows this is the pinnacle of the sport. This is the Mecca, the UFC and being in the UFC, I can prove truly that I'm the greatest welterweight in the world. You know, if I go somewhere else and win a title, you know, people aren't going to give me the credit. I mean, I don't get credit as it is anyways. Everybody wants to downplay everything I've done and act like I've never done anything because, you know, they're just so in their feelings. And these are all liberal cucks. But, you know, at the end of the day, you know, I'm here to be the greatest in the world. And, and I want to fight the greatest in the world. I'm, I'm not scared like journeyman Judas Masvidal. I'm not running from the hard fights. I'm looking for the hardest fights. I'm looking for the challenges of the people that think that they can beat me. So, you know, I want to be in the UFC forever. I, I would love to retire in the UFC, be in the Hall of Fame, do the whole spiel, you know. Yeah, of course, mm. me and UFC have had a tumultuous relationship, but it can be fixed really easy. You know, I'm ready to play ball. All they have to do is give me the ball and I'm going to go in and score a touchdown. Well, this is good. This is nice. I, I feel like uh, we're becoming the Dr. Phil of uh, MMA shows, you know, <laughs> mending, mending bridges, mending fences. This is nice. But I, I wanted to ask you, because we were talking uh, just before on the program about all these negotiations, you know, Cejudo seemingly retiring to, to you know, force the UFC's hand. And then now John Jones uh, vacating his belt to sort of force the UFC's hand. And obviously you're no stranger to negotiations. So I wanted to ask you, d- what did you think of John Jones, sort of these negotiations that he's having with the UFC at the moment? It's seems like everybody's kind of trying to you know get more money but the ufc aren't really budging at the moment the the funniest thing about the john jones thing is that he just conveniently has a camera set up right as he's stealing some spray can spray cans from you know two two people two protesters and rioters in the street i just I think it's just hilarious how fake he is. And now he's trying to act like he's a baby face hero. Dude, you're a scumbag, dude. You were just shooting guns, getting a DUI last week, man. Where, where were you at when the cops were there? You know, you were just wrapping a Bentley around a pool with two hookers in the back while your wife and kids were at home. Where were you then? All your steroids you've done, all the cocaine you've done. Man, you're not a good guy. You're not a hero, John. Stop trying to act like you're a hero. So it's pathetic. I mean, the guy's out there begging you know, for money and this and that. And then all of a sudden, mysteriously, there's just a cameraman set up and, and he's, you know, he's the good guy again. He wants to be a baby face hero and look good for negotiations with Dana, his boss. So, you know, he, the guy's a complete joke. I mean, he doesn't deserve to be paid. I mean, look at, look at his history. Look at his track record, man. The guy can't get out of his own way. I mean, it's one thing to make a mistake, but it's another thing to continually make the same mistake one after another, after another, after another, after another, after another. After another. So the guy's a dirtbag, man. I mean, he shouldn't be paid anything. The guy shouldn't even be fighting. He should be suspended for his whole career. When you fail two or three steroid tests, I don't even know why he's still in the UFC. Hmm. What did you make of him vacating the belt? I know that when you were negotiating with the UFC, you know, the belt, the the interim belt was sort of a a big point for you. What did you think about him, you know, seemingly dropping the belt? That's a pretty wild chess move as far as negotiations go. I mean, let's be honest, guys. Belts don't mean anything anymore. The, the belts mean nothing. I mean, that doesn't, 
you know, the, the biggest fights that can be made, you know, they're not with belts anymore. You know, those aren't the big fights. You know, look at me and George Mossfall. There's no belt. It's just a real beef, you know, and that's that's the biggest fight that can be made, you know. And for John, you know, bigger fights are a heavyweight or, or you know, maybe with Adesanya, you know, that could be his biggest fight. So there's really not belts that are needed anymore these days for negotiating and, and for showing your worth and, and your drawing power. So the belt has no relevance to negotiations. Mm. I want to talk about Colby Covington Incorporated for a second because you mentioned it and it's your new training camp. When you were sort of deciding what you were going to do next and where you were going to go next, did you look at the big teams like AKA or Jackson Wilk a Winkle John or any of the other ones when making your decision? Did you come close to going over to any of those teams? Did you speak to any other teams before starting up your own thing? No, you know, the thing is, guys, is – that I was already a part of a team for 10 years. You know, I, I started American top team, you know, unlike any of those other fighters, Joanne, Dustin and George, they all started other camps. You know, Dustin started in Louisiana. George started in Miami FFA. Joanne started in Poland. So, you know, I was, I was bred from the day that I started my MMA career at American top team. And I don't want to be a part of a team anymore. I don't want someone to be able to tell me what I can and cannot do. I'm my own boss. No one tells me what to do. Like, uh, you know, I, if you have feelings and, and this and that and you want to complain, I'm the head of the compa complaint department. You can't go to some gym owner and complain to him to kick me off the team anymore. So I just didn't want to be a part of any team anymore because, you know, I don't want to put them in that same position that I put Dan Lambert where he's forced to have to, to do some crazy things and he's forced to, you know, have to – to just be under pressure every single day. I don't want to put people through that, that stress. You know, I want people's lives to be easier. I actually am a decent human being. I'm not a piece of shit, you know, like Dustin or George, you know, who, who pretend to be good guys on the camera, but off the camera, they're actually the biggest trash bags in the whole entire world. All right, Colby. Well, we appreciate the opportunity to speak to you. As we wrap up, I mean, the big question, and let's finish it off like this. You know, a lot of people are saying, like uh, Jorge Mazadal said that, you know, this is – not going to be good for uh, Colby Covington in his next fight. He won't look the way that he looked because he's no longer at ATT and he'll probably be fighting on Indian reservations. So we imagine that there's a bit of extra uh, chip on your shoulder when you go out for this next performance to show them Colby Covington 2.0. But the question is, if you could pick a perfect date and a perfect opponent, lay it out for us. When is Colby Covington back and who will it be against and how does it play out? The sooner, the better, guys. I've, I've never been more motivated since my last fight. Just just how it went down in December, all the corruption, the robbery, the setup even before the fight. You know, I'm not going to go into the things they did to me. Uh, you know, I wasn't at my best, you know, and you saw me, you know, at 50 percent. And, and I lost on my worst night to a guy that was on his best night. Imagine what happens when I'm on my best night. So I'm, I'm ready to go. I've been prepared. I was ready to fight Woodley on five days notice, you know, last month. You don't think I'm ready to go on five days notice right now? So the, the perfect picture, perfect fight I could go right now is next weekend against Journeyman Judas Masvidal. And we just go down to American Airlines Arena over in Miami. Just find out who the king of Miami is. Find out who's the real, who's the real Scarface of Miami, who really runs Miami those streets. So that will be my perfect fight. And everybody knows how that fight's going down. You can go look it on YouTube, man. We used to to fight in, in our living room. We used to fight in bathrooms. We used to fight in the streets. Man, we used to fight for free all the time. Now we're going to make tons of money to go fight. Everybody knows it's going to happen. I will leave him motionless in that octagon. He'll never be the same person again. He'll 100% need a psychologist to help him out the rest of his life. And, you know, he's, he, he might just end up committing suicide because he's going to be so depressed. Wow. Well, there you go, guys. The owner and manager and president of Colby Covington Incorporated. We can't wait to see what, who's next. In the meantime, grab your Colby Covington shirts from ProWrestlingTees.com slash MMA-Fighter slash Colby Cove MMA. Such classic designs as the People's Champ t-shirts up there. Follow them at Colby Cove MMA on Twitter and Instagram. Colby, really appreciate your time and thank you so much for coming back on the program. Appreciate it. And one last thing, guys, you know, let's let's also not forget about my other big fight that I'm looking for. Drew McIntyre. He's been talking mm. all this shit over. What's going on? What's going on with that? What's happening with that? We keep seeing a little bit of a chatter between you two. What's the latest on it? Is he ducking you? Is Drew McIntyre ducking you? Well, you know, the world has been pandemonium, pandemonium lately. You know, we got mm. this pandemic going on, this this fake hoax, you know, this 
coronavirus that everybody found out was a fake lie and it's not a the, the numbers don't add up and there's fake numbers but it's hard to find people right now and i can find anybody i don't care i will find you it doesn't matter who you are i will find you you know i found dana white in the blackjack table in the palms i find someone when i want to find them but right now in the world with businesses shut down with curfews and all this stuff going on i can't find drew mcintyre to save my life so as soon as the world goes back to normal i will find drew mcintyre i promise you that guys and before that I know my boy Bobby Lashley is going to knock him out this weekend at Backlash, and I'm going to go over there and piss on Drew McIntyre's ashes. And then Jeez. after Drew McIntyre goes to the hospital, I'm going to go to the hospital because Bobby's going to tell me which hospital he's going to be at, and I'm going to beat his ass again for all the talk he's been talking. He's saying he's six foot six and he's 100 pounds bigger than me, bitch. When you're, when you're on the ground, you ain't going to be six foot six. You ain't going to be 300 pounds when you're on your back getting slapped up like the little hillbilly that you are. So... He, I'm gonna send his ass back to Scotland, and, and he'll never be the same as well. You know, Jeez. I will find. Once this stuff ends, guys, I will find Drew McIntyre. Mark my words. Man, Drew McIntyre, after hearing this, isn't even gonna show up to Backlash, and you know the issues that the WWE are having with their roster. So, don't don't piss off Vince McMahon too much. But just quickly, uh, if you were to go into the world of WWE, I wanted to ask you this last time, and we'll finish it on this: What is the Colby Covington finishing move? What's a cold, and can you give us a little preview? You know, the, the, the Colby Covington uh, finishing move is, is still a work in progress. You know, mm -hmm. I'm working every day. And when I'm done with my MMA training, we're working on different ideas and different finishes. But, you know, it's going to be something real. You know, it's going to be, you know, when you get into that ring, you're, you're getting into a fight. You know, I'm a fighter. That's what I do best. You know, and I'm the best fighter in the world. So when I get in that, when I get in that ring, if I get in an unsanctioned fight outside the ring for WWE, it doesn't matter. You know, it's going to be pain. I will inflict pain, and, and everybody knows I'm the king of chaos. So, you know, you can expect chaos when I get in that WWE ring. Well, there you go, guys. Big things come out. We'll let you go, Colby, and we really appreciate your time. Follow the man at Colby Cuff MMA on Twitter and Instagram. Always, always appreciate it. Thank you, Colby. Appreciate it, guys. Have a good day.